A man in South Korea urges Seoul to send troops to the Strait of Hormuz. The U.S. wants a broad international coalition to defend the vital waterway from Iranian threats. South Korea is still considering it. Plus, it's finally here. The 2020 Consumer Electronics Show opens in Las Vegas. We'll take you there to see the latest tech and gadgets that are coming our way this year. So we start with the huge but not entirely unexpected news that Iran has launched multiple missile attacks on U.S. air bases in Iraq. It happened early this morning. The attack comes five days after the U.S. killed the top Iranian commander in a drone strike in Baghdad. We have our Hong Yu on the line with the latest to what is still an extremely fluid situation. So, uh, you, how many missiles do we know that uh, Iran has launched at these bases? Well, Mar, the exact number of missiles fired is yet to be confirmed, but multiple ballistic missiles, more than a dozen, have been launched, according to the U.S. assistant to the Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs, Jonathan Hoffman. The missiles were launched from Iran and targeted at least two Iraqi military bases where U.S. forces are based. There is no word yet on the number of casualties. Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps announced through their press TV that these missiles hit al-Assad Air Force Base in western Iraq, where U.S. forces are based. The Revolutionary Guard wrote on a banner on press TV that it will target any regional state that becomes a platform for U.S. aggression. And the move was described as a revenge for the killing of top Iranian General Qassem Soleimani. Now, we expect some kind of strong response from President Trump to this retaliation, which seems to be uh, fairly devastating. Like I say, we don't know the casualties yet, but these are ballistic missiles that were fired at air bases. Have we had any concrete response yet from Washington or the White House? Well, the attack has been confirmed by the White House, and President Trump has been briefed on the attack. Trump is monitoring the situation and consulting with his national security team, according to the White House press secretary, Stephanie Grisham. Both U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and Secretary of Defense Mike Esper have arrived at the White House to discuss the matter. On Tuesday, Esper said in a briefing that the U.S. should expect Iran to retaliate. He also said that the U.S. will respond appropriately to whatever they do. Back to you, Mark. OK, thank you very much to that report and we'll keep you updated uh, on what's happening in the Middle East throughout the day today here on Arirang News. Now, in a semi-related matter, the US envoy to South Korea has expressed hope that Seoul will send troops to help patrol the strategically vital Strait of Hormuz amid the sharp uptick in Middle East tensions. Lee Sung Jae with the details. In an interview with local broadcaster KBS on Tuesday, the U.S. ambassador to South Korea, Harry Harris, said the Trump administration would welcome Seoul sending South Korean troops and military hardware to the Strait of Hormuz amid heightened tensions in the Middle East following Washington's killing late last week of Iran's top general. While expressing those hopes, Harris noted how South Korea gets so much of its energy from the Middle East. He also stressed that any number of troops deployed to the region would be helpful. The recent drone strike, which killed Iran's top general, has raised expectations that Washington will step up calls for its allies to contribute to maritime security operations in the waterway. The Strait of Hormuz hosts key shipping lanes for 20 percent of world oil trade and more than 70 percent of South Korea's oil imports. Earlier on Tuesday, Seoul's foreign ministry said no decision has been made on whether to send troops to the region, adding that an interagency review is underway in consideration of the need to protect South Korean ships and nationals that pass through the waterway. This comes as Seoul's top national security adviser, Chung Yong, arrived in Washington on Tuesday for talks with his U.S. and Japanese counterparts following North Korea's renewed threats. Asked by reporters if Seoul and Washington plan to discuss the possibility of deploying South Korean troops to the Strait of Hormuz, Chung said the allies will share views on various different issues, not just North Korea. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News.
Now, despite the turmoil in the Middle East at the moment, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says Washington remains hopeful that it can have a conversation with North Korea over its promise to dismantle its nuclear weapons program. Speaking at a press briefing on Tuesday local time, Pompeo said North Korea has not fired any ICBMs despite the expiration of its self-imposed year-end deadline for more flexibility from the U.S., which uh, didn't end up coming. He added the two sides remain engaged and hopeful that denuclearization talks will resume. Pompeo's remarks follow North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's threat to showcase a new strategic weapon in protest of the stalled nuclear talks. <laughs> Now, it's a new year and the diplomatic fallout from the U.S. drone killing of Iran's top military commander could spread as far as the Korean Peninsula and have some serious repercussions for the tens of millions of people living here. Experts say the strength of the U.S. response against Iran could really test the South Korea-U.S. alliance and make the denuclearization of North Korea all the more complicated. Kim Jeon reports. On the defense front, 2020 is expected to be an important year for the South Korea-U.S. alliance, considered an essential pillar in achieving a final fully verified denuclearization of North Korea. Dissatisfied with the outcome of denuclearization talks with the U.S. during the past year, North Korea is expected to reveal its new path while pretending major provocations through its new strategic weapon. Experts had said the weapon could be an intercontinental ballistic missile capable of carrying multiple warheads, a submarine-launched ballistic missile, the launching of satellites, or to rescind a moratorium on nuclear and ICBM tests. It seems that both North Korea and the U.S. have already pursued separate paths, with the North focused on advancing its nuclear weapons capability, while the U.S. stands firm in maintaining economic sanctions on the regime. Apart from level of threat, the timing of the North's provocation has also been highly speculated in defense circles, with the Pentagon reportedly stating North Korea may conduct some form of provocation early this year, perhaps at around the birthday of the late former leader Kim Jong-il on February 16th. Meanwhile, multiple sources from the South Korean military have said the U.S. drone strike of Iran's top commander, General Qasem Soleimani, conducted last week could be a critical factor for North Korea in masterminding its weapons testing. The episode has certainly become an unexpected variant to Seoul, which has been contemplating ways to participate in a mission to ensure the freedom of navigation in the geopolitically important Strait of Hormuz upon Washington's request. This came after the two sides were at loggerheads on a number of contentious issues during last year, with one of them being the role of the U.S.-led United Nations Command on the Korean Peninsula, with many believing the U.S. intends to maintain its military authority, even after Washington completes the transfer of wartime operational control to Seoul. Kim ji Arirang News. Now, we couldn't finish today's preview of the new year without talking about the turmoil that continues to grip Hong Kong. Many watchers expect a similar, if not more, chaotic 2020 than what we saw for more than half of last year in Hong Kong. Om Jiang has this report. Since last year, Hong Kong has been rocked by pro-democracy protests that have captured international attention. It was June 9th when about a million Hong Kong citizens took to the streets against a controversial bill proposed by the government of Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam that would have allowed for criminal suspects to be extradited to mainland China for trial. Tensions peaked in November when police shot a 21-year-old demonstrator and a student died after falling from a parking lot near a protest site. The demonstrators had initially made five demands, which included the full withdrawal of the extradition bill, the release of all protesters who had been detained, an investigation into police misconduct during the demonstrations, and free and democratic elections. A sixth demand has been added in the past month, which is for the Hong Kong police to be reformed. 
An expert in Korea says that although the protesters claim they will not stop until the government meets all of their demands, the most important one is direct elections for both the city's chief executive and its legislative council. The key demand is direct elections, because the protesters think that it will bring about fundamental improvements in Hong Kong society. The withdrawn extradition bill and what it implied prompted many Hong Kong citizens to consider electing their leader directly. She adds that the protests will end when Beijing allows universal suffrage in electing Hong Kong's leader and legislature. She also says Beijing is likely to enact the national security law that will push Hong Kong to crack down on the protesters. Another expert says China will instead take a long-term approach to the situation and maintain the one country, two systems policy. If the central government tries to suppress protesters with armed force, it could easily become an international human rights issue. And this, in turn, could be used by the U.S. to discredit China. A professor in Hong Kong says the Chinese government will resist the movement's demands and so there is very little prospect for any settlement. We had elections in Hong Kong for district council members and the pan-democratic forces won big in those elections. And uh, now they're looking forward to elections for the Legislative Council, which is the Parliament of Hong Kong. And those will take place in September. So at the very least, we can expect that demonstrations will continue uh, until then. The expert adds that the fight will continue indefinitely because one-third of the population is more or less okay with the relationship with the mainland, but about 50 percent of the population is not. Om Ji-young, Arirang News. A stampede at the funeral for Iran's top general Qasem Soleimani has left at least 56 people dead and injured more than 200 in his hometown of Kerman as tens of thousands of mourners gathered for the ceremony. The incident prompted authorities to postpone the barrier ceremony originally scheduled for Tuesday afternoon with no new time given. According to reports out of Iran, authorities cited concerns about the massive crowd as a reason for the delay. It's estimated up to a million people took to the streets to pay tribute to Soleimani. While there is no information on what set off the stampede, reports say the crowd was shouting for revenge against the U.S. Puerto Rico was hit on Tuesday by the strongest earthquake to hit the island in 102 years. A series of strong quakes, which included a magnitude 6.4 quake, struck the U.S. territory. It killed at least one person, but it's unclear if the death toll could rise. Drinking water has been cut off to some 300,000 people and power was out across the island. Officials say at least 346 people were left homeless, and homes and buildings were destroyed in the south of the island. The island has been hit by a series of hundreds of quakes since December 28th, including magnitude 4 or greater. Puerto Rico's governor declare, declared a state of emergency and activated the National Guard following Tuesday's quake. I have just signed the declaration of state of emergency. We have signed the state of declaration for all of Puerto Rico. We are all anxious and nervous. It is natural. We are talking about a situation that Puerto Rico has experienced in the last 102 years. Once declared an emergency, the island can seek financial aid through the U.S. territory. Some Congress members have reportedly appealed to President Trump for aid. The White House said Trump has been briefed on the matter. Puerto Rico is still recovering from the devastating hurricane that struck it in 2017. <coughs> The Tokyo District Court has decided to forfeit the 14 million U.S. dollar bail against former Nissan chairman Carlos Ghosn after he violated his bail conditions last month by fleeing Japan without permission. The court's decision on Tuesday came comes after it granted the prosecutor's request for revocation of Ghosn's bail. The forfeited sum is believed to be the largest ever in Japan and will be transferred to state coffers. Gon, who fled to Lebanon, will not be returned to Japan, as the Middle Eastern nation has no extradition agreement with Tokyo. Gon is set to hold a press conference on Wednesday in Beirut, which will be broadcast live.
So the future of consumer technology has arrived in Las Vegas at the annual Consumer Electronics Show. The world's largest IT exhibition opened Tuesday local time with some 4,500 companies from 155 countries showcasing their latest tech. Flying cars, no less, from Hyundai Motor, portrait mode TV screens from Samsung and the latest rollable TV screens from LG are some of the most eye-catching items at the show. The running theme of the exhibition is AI in everything as well as mobility and smart health solutions. Now, science fiction is steadily becoming science fact, whether we like it or not. Artificial humans have been unveiled at CES in Las Vegas, and they are armed with the ability to show emotions and intelligence. After weeks of anticipation on social media, Samsung Star Labs subsidiary on Tuesday revealed its so-called Neon Project. It's a lineup of computer-generated avatars who look and behave like real people and respond to their owners in a matter of milliseconds. Powered by an AI system, they're expected to be launched for corporate use, becoming teachers, flight attendants and even doctors. Samsung insists Neon is not a regular smart assistant, but a 100% visually real friend to human beings. So CES is now up and running and South Korean IT giants are already in the glitzy oasis of Nevada showing off some of their latest hardware for all the visitors. O.C. Young, Fast's report from Las Vegas. The show hasn't started yet, but the battle of the screens has already begun. Ahead of the annual consumer electronics show in Las Vegas, South Korea's tech giants have showcased their latest dazzling TV displays and smart home devices. LG on Monday revealed its new OLED TV screens, the industry's first to be certified as 8K ultra high definition. The TV runs on LG's own AI processor, which upscales video quality to 8K, recognizes and enhances video and audio quality by sharpening faces and text on screen. Samsung also revealed its own 8K lineup of thin micro LED displays over the weekend. They come with similar AI features, but showcases the industry's first almost frameless display, a 99% screen to display ratio. Its lifestyle TV called Sedo, meaning vertical in Korean, won the CES Innovation Award this year for its ability to rotate between the portrait and landscape modes in sync with your smartphone. Samsung's infinity screen was very impressive. It's they're really pushing the boundaries of design and really creating a product that blends into your environment rather than taking it over. I really like the LG gallery television. I think it's very impressive. The OLED picture quality is remarkable and the, the ability to display those amazing black levels, the compatibility with gaming devices as well. I think that's a really important feature as well. So it's, it's a net net a competition between Samsung and LG this year to bring 8K for the masses. 8K TVs won't be as cheap or as affordable as 4K TVs this year. But of course, at the same time, this would help companies bring more innovations to the 8K world, as we already have 8K cameras. In another face-off, both companies are expected to display their AI-equipped refrigerators that can identify the food inside it to draw up recipes and shopping lists. Robot chefs and cleaning devices are also part of each firm's smart connected home solution. It's hard to determine which Korean tech giant is coming out stronger, but what's certain is that both LG and Samsung are setting the standard high for connected AI-based home technology, which industry experts say will become the talk of this year's show. Woo Seung, Arirang News, Las Vegas. Now, Samsung Electronics might be enjoying Las Vegas at the moment, but their quarterly earnings dropped by over a third on year in the fourth quarter of last year. However, its performance beat market estimates, indicating that memory chip prices are beginning to climb out of what has been quite a persistent downturn. The world's top chip maker reported a 34% fall in operating income to 6.1 billion US dollars in the October to December period. Sales edged down 0.6% on a year to 50 billion dollars. The earnings guidance released Wednesday ahead of full earnings later this month didn't provide specific breakdowns of each division. For the whole of 2019, Samsung's operating profits fell 53% on year. 
Now, K-pop superstars BTS will release their new album next month and their fans are already celebrating their return on Twitter with the hashtag 7 is coming trending worldwide. Their agency Big Hit Entertainment announced on Wednesday that Map of the Soul 7 will be released on February 21st around the world. Advance orders for the CD version begin Thursday and other details will be revealed through BTS's Weverse and the band's Fan Cafe. The new album comes 10 months since the release of the Map of the Soul Persona album, which sold almost 3.7 million units and hit number one on the US Billboard 200 album chart. Now, this winter has been unusually warm here in Korea. We must remember that we're almost in the middle of January, but snow is nowhere to be found in Seoul, and people are even walking around wearing short sleeves in some parts of the country. Our Kim Dami reports. One of the symbols of the country's freezing winter, the frozen Han River remains rather warm and ice-free. It's the unseasonably warm winter that's keeping the river from freezing over. In fact, the average temperature in Korea last month was just below 3 degrees Celsius. That's the eighth warmest average temperature for the month of December since 1973. The temperature has only fallen below minus 10 degrees Celsius for two days so far this winter. There hasn't been any snow either. The amount of snowfall in Seoul last month was only 0.3 centimeters, the lowest on record for December. The Korea Meteorological Administration attributed the warm weather to the weakened Siberian high-pressure system that usually pushes cold air further south during the winter. The unusual climatic situation will continue for a while longer, so it's going to be hard to enjoy snow until mid to late January. Down in Jeju Island, spring doesn't seem too far away. It's not hard to spot people wearing short sleeve shirts, and flowers like rape blossoms are even preparing to bloom. The highest temperature hit 23 degrees Celsius on Tuesday, officially recorded as the hottest day of any January since records began. The unusually snug weather has delayed winter events, including the famous Hwacheon Sancheonno Ice Festival. However, it is still too early to greet spring as the cold air from the Arctic is expected to reach down to Korea by early next month. Kim Dami, Arirang News. Good morning. Seoul received its heaviest one-day rainfall on record in January yesterday. It saw about 46 millimeters. That's the double average during the whole of January. And most of the rain is forecast to let up this afternoon, while parts of Gangwon-do province will see rain or snow into the evening. And after the rain clears, the winter chill will move in tonight. So we are expecting freezing morning lows tomorrow. Dress warmly. If you plan to head home late tonight, you will also need a face mask. Dust levels will rise in the central region this afternoon. But as for the highs, most parts of the country will see single-digit afternoon highs. And those of you on Jeju Island will notice a high that's nearly 15 degrees lower than yesterday, topping out at 9 degrees Celsius. Colder air will return, but there should not be a major cold snap to make us shiver too badly. That's Korea for you, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world.
Now, before we uh, go, we do have some breaking news regarding Iran. U.S. President Donald Trump is going to address uh, the nation from the Oval Office uh, later tonight. Local time is what we're hearing this following Iran's uh, ballistic missile attacks on at least two uh, air bases in Iraq housing U.S. troops. The exact time of the address, though, is still to be uh, determined. As far as we know, he's still thought to be consulting with his national uh, security uh, team, including the Defense Secretary Mark Esper and uh, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. But we'll be sure to bring you any updates uh, when we have our next newscast here on Arirang TV. It's coming up at noon Korea time. So until then, goodbye.